I'm going to continue uh, with this theme from last week. Last week, it was uh, a message over Paul's prayer for the church, and in that, I just want to say thank you for your concerns for me. Uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, I, 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 I said it last week, I don't know if you heard me or not, but, but I really am in a good spot. I, I, I'm good. Everything I said last week had nothing to do with something that is currently happening in my life. I'm just trying to paint a picture of what pastors experience. And so nothing bad has happened. There's no frustration. I really am in a, in a good spot. But I also recognize I know where we're going. And listen, if for 46 messages through Romans chapter 1, verse 11, if you haven't been frustrated or agitated at something in any of those messages, I'm pretty sure from chapters 12 through 16, I'm going to find something that's going to rub you the wrong way. We're going to be talking about dedicated service to God, how all of God's children are expected to serve. We're going to be talking about our attitude towards our government, the principles of conscience. We're going to talk about self-denial for the benefit of others. Like, if you haven't been frustrated, I'm sure it's coming. And knowing that it's coming, I recognize the burden that I have in proclaiming the truth of God's Word. And I receive that warmly. I welcome God's calling upon my life. And I said it last week, and I mean it. Uh, It is a joy, an honor, and a privilege to give my life in service to God and his church. So I'm thankful for that. So last week was not because something has happened. Maybe that was preemptive because I know something potentially might happen as we unpack chapters 12 through 16. Today we're going to continue with this thought on prayer. And so the uh, primary text is going to come from 1 Timothy chapter 2. I don't have any extra verses on the screens for you today, so you're going to have to write and take notes and, and record all these things for yourselves. I will say this, full disclosure, I'm not going to be done by 1130. So if you have lunch appointments or you have to leave at 1130, Just leave now, it'll be less uh, disruptive, and we're going to go just a little bit into overtime this morning. When we think about prayer, prayer is one of the greatest privileges extended unto us. Do you ever sit and wonder what would happen if God's people truly understood the significance of prayer? Not only that, if God's people faithfully practice this discipline of prayer, God's Word, time and time again, gives us the mandate that we're to be people of prayer. For instance, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18 says, to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in prayer. Christ Jesus. God commands us to pray without ceasing. I believe partly because he delights in fellowship with his children. He commands us to give thanks in every circumstance and situation because he knows that everything we face is an opportunity for the gospel to be advanced and for him to receive glory. And and so the greatest example that we find uh, on the importance and the priority of having a a consistent prayer life is seen no other than in the life of our Lord and Savior, Christ Himself. Let me give you some examples of some of the characteristics that describe Jesus' prayer life. Jesus would pray for others, not just Himself. In John chapter 17, verse number 9, Jesus' prayer, he says, I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but on those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So he modeled praying for others. Jesus would pray alone when he's all by himself, 
Luke chapter 5, verse number 16, says that Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness and pray. So sometimes he prayed by himself, but other times he prayed with other people. Luke chapter 9, verse number 28, says that Jesus took along Peter, John, and James, and all of them went up to the mountain to pray. So he prayed alone and he prayed with others. Jesus prayed wherever he was. Jesus prayed in nature. Luke chapter 6, verse number 12 says it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. He could have went to a home to pray. He could have went to a synagogue to pray. If he was close to Jerusalem, he could have went to the temple to pray. But there were times when Jesus made the decision to pray at the spot that he was at, which happened to often be in nature, outside. We're surrounded by so much that is man-made that it is sometimes difficult for us to remember that this is not our world. We are living in the midst of God's beautiful handiwork. So Jesus prayed alone with others in nature. Sometimes Jesus' prayers were short. Sometimes they were long. An example of a short prayer is Matthew chapter 6. We refer to that as the Lord's Prayer. It is short, but it is full of wisdom. It's short enough to be easily memorized. It serves as an example of a sprint rather than a marathon. So Jesus gives us an example of those short praying moments. But he also gives us an example of long extended times of prayer. In Luke chapter 6, verse number 12, says that it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. But then it goes on to say, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. He gives us the example that sometimes we need to, to send short prayers to God. But there are other times where we need to, to dedicate long periods of time in prayer with our Father. Jesus, his prayer life would have been described as being consistent or regular. Back to the passage I cited earlier from Luke chapter 5, verse number 16. It says, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. The word often is not hidden. It makes it obvious that, that Jesus prayed regularly. And when Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed knowing who was in charge. Like he understood who's in charge. Jesus knew this as he cries out on the night that he's betrayed from the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed knowing that ultimately God is in charge. Three times he prays that night. In Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39, it says, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then in verse 42, it says the second time, he says, My Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And then in verse number 44, it says, And he left them again, and he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Three times Jesus prayed, asking for an easier path. Yet in each of those times, Jesus prayed, not mine, but your will be done. In this prayer, Jesus gives us tremendous and, and yet simple insight into prayer. And that is that ultimately, God is the one who's in charge. All of this makes me wonder why it is that so many of us spend so little time before the throne of God's grace. Even those that might be constant in their prayers are often so selfish in those requests 
that their prayers rarely go beyond themselves or even their family members. Think of it like this. How often, or how much time do you spend in prayer for, for, for the needs, for the welfare, or for the salvation of other people? A lot of the times we're so focused on our own wants, wishes, and desires that we rarely go beyond ourselves and really intercede and pray on behalf of others. I never was one, and let me be clear, this is a personal preference part, okay? I, I never was one that, that bought into the, the phenomenon some 20, I think 22 years ago that was referred to with the little book, The Prayer of Jabez. Maybe, maybe you remember that. It was a big deal at, 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 at one point. And the prayer of Jabez comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse number 10. I'll read it for you, right? This, this one verse. And it says, Now Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my borders, and that your right hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, that it may not pain me. And God granted him what he requested. Now, I'm not... Like, I get, I understand the attraction for this prayer. Like, like I, I, I get it. God's blessing, victory in battles, God's protection, you know, protection from, from harm, not experiencing pain, receiving the blessing of prosperity. I mean, who wouldn't want these things? Uh, all of each of these things, none of them are, are bad in and of them selves the question becomes what is the basis for this prayer is it so that one can have a life of comfort and ease no problems no worries or does it come from a heart that truly seeks to glorify god and expand his kingdom work in this world and so you know there was never a follow-up to the prayer of Jabez, at least as far as I'm aware of, there, it wasn't matched with the, with the phenomenon referred to as the prayer of Agor. You, you, do you ever read that book? Get those bracelets? Do you know the prayer of Agor? Anyone? Raise your hand. Someone? Not a soul. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. We have limited details about Agor. What we know from him comes from Proverbs chapter 30. According to verse number 1, he was weary and worn out. According to verses 2 through 4, we see that he did not consider himself to be very wise. Then in verses uh, 5 and 6, uh, he considers God's word to be completely true, which I would say that's a pretty wise understanding of God's word. But then we find his prayer in verses 7 through 9. This is the prayer of Agor. Two things I ask of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Number one, keep deception and lies far from me. Number two, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion that I not be fool and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. The heart of the prayer of Agor is that he would be content with the provisions of God. This reminds me of the Apostle Paul. Yeah, yeah true. Paul never recorded a prayer that said give me neither poverty nor riches but paul experienced both of them and in his experience of having plenty and having nothing he writes these words in philippians chapter 4 philippians 4 verse 12 says i know how to get along with humble means and i also know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And then he gives it to us. 
Proverbs 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This morning, I, I want to really focus in on the privilege of prayer. And it is a massive privilege that God extends unto us. So our primary text is 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll look at verses 1 through 8. And in these eight verses, we're going to extract from them six truths about prayer. Truth number one is the priority of prayer. Verse number one begins with these words. It says, first of all, then I urge. First of all stresses just how important prayer is. In other words, above all else, before you do anything else, pray. Pray. It's sad to see how, how prayer has lost its importance within the church. We spend more time talking about what needs to be prayed about rather than praying about the things that we have talked about. That's why we can have 200 people show up for a worship gathering and a dozen or maybe two dozen show up for a prayer service. We, we just don't have that value placed on, on the privilege that we have to go before the throne of God's grace. So, so prayer must take a preeminence in our lives and in the life of the church. So we see the priority of prayer. Then we'll see the variety of prayer. Verse 1 Continue, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Uh, there are at least seven different words in the Greek language referring uh, to prayer. Four of them are used here in this verse. The first one, depending on your translation, says either entreaties or supplications. Right? That's the first one. Supplications is another way of saying requests or petitions. It's, it means to, to ask with urgency based upon a presumed need. And so when we see a need in the life of other people, then we are urged to take those petitions before the throne of grace and to present those requests with a sense of urgency in our own heart and life. I mean, just think about what this world, what, what, our, what our community, what this church would look like if we truly took the names and the needs of others before the throne of grace and we pleaded with God with a strong, intense urgency. And, and that we were characterized as, as being a group of people that consistently did this. Not occasionally, not quarterly, but our lives were marked by this characteristic. So we see entreaties and supplications. The second is just simply referred to as prayers. This is the more general word. It is the most common term that's used to describe this activity with God. This refers to a special time of prayer. A special time that we set aside with, for, for personal devotion, reflection, and prayer with God. Prayer is not just a time to express our wants and our needs. Prayer is an act of worship. So we have supplications. There's prayers. And then the third one, petitions. Or your translation might say intercessions. Uh, this word comes uh, from a Greek verb that means to speak to someone on behalf of someone else. To speak to someone on behalf of someone else. It's to intercede. It's to intercede on behalf of someone. 
We refer to this as intercessory prayer. Right? Intercessory prayer is praying to God on behalf of other people. Particularly on behalf of those who aren't believers. We're interceding on their behalf. Praying to God. Asking for divine intervention. Asking for opportunities in the Holy Spirit to work into the heart and life of a non-believer. And so there's petitions and intercessions. And then the fourth one that he gives us is that of thanksgiving. We're to thank God for hearing and answering our prayers. We're to thank Him for what He has done, what He is doing, and what He promises to do. Make no mistake, Paul's not trying to to make these terms exclusive to each other. No, rather, he's encouraging, he's urging the, the Christian community to offer prayers of all kinds for all people. And that gets us to the next point. We have the priority of prayer, the variety of prayer, and then number three would be the objects of prayer. Verse 1 concludes with, that it be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. All men makes it clear that no person is outside the influence of prayer. I thought that would have generated a little bit of excitement from someone. You understand how profound that is? No person is outside the influence of prayer. We're called to pray for all people, which means we pray for believers and we pray for non-believers. We pray for for the people that are near and dear to us and the, the people who are far away and unknown to us. We pray for our family, our friends, and loved ones, as well as we pray for our enemies and those that despise, mock, and ridicule us. Prayers are to be offered for all. Paul even says he urges the Christian community to pray for those that are in authority. Like, at this time, Who's he referring to? He's referring to Nero. A godless, ruthless, cruel, vile individual. And Paul is calling for the Christian community to offer prayers for him. Which means even if, or rather, even when we don't respect the man or the woman who's in a position of authority over our lives, we must respect the office they hold, and we must remain true to God's calling and expectation that we pray for them. We pray for them. And I'll say it. Our president needs our prayers more than he needs our posts. He needs our prayers for humility, wisdom, a broken spirit, uh, to walk in in an understanding in the light of God's Word. He needs that so much more than our posts that seek to criticize or, or, or critique His decisions. But that's all of our leaders need that. Our lives should be marked with a, with, with a heart that's tender and, and willing to intercede on their behalf for the glory of God to be known and to be revealed through their decisions. All men is a key in this paragraph. We find all men in verse 1, and we will find it all again in verse number 4. We pray for all because Christ died for all. And it's God's will that all would be saved. We have the priority of prayer, the variety of prayer, the objects of prayer, and then we see the reasons for prayer. Verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved 
to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Greek word good in verse number 3 emphasizes the idea of something being intrinsically good. Not just good in its effects. Synonyms to that word would be perhaps fair or even beautiful might be a better one. Yes, prayer is a good practice, but prayer also brings about beautiful things. And and that's what Paul is trying to communicate. Yes, prayer is pleasing to the Lord. It pleases the Father when His children pray to Him. The Pharisees, well, they prayed in order to be praised by individuals. But committed Christians, we're to pray, and when we pray, it pleases the Father. This suggests that that we must pray in accordance to the will of God. Because it certainly doesn't please God when we pray selfishly. We, we pray in accordance to His will. So Scripture teaches us. 1 John chapter 5, verses 13-15 through 15 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Then it says, This is the confidence which we have before Him. That if we ask anything in accordance to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, and whenever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from Him. It has often been said that the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but rather to get God's will accomplished on earth. So we are to call or to pray in accordance to the will of the Father. So we have the priority, the variety, the objects, the reason. Verse number five, five through seven, we'll see the basis for prayer. Verse five says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Prayer is based upon the work of Jesus as both Savior and Mediator. So, so, so since there is only one God, there is need for only one mediator. And that mediator is Jesus. No other person qualifies. Jesus is the only one. You are simply wasting your breath. You are wasting your time praying in the name of anyone other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is one mediator. We have the priority, the variety, the objects, the reasons, the basis. Now we'll wrap it up with the attitude of prayer. Verse 8. Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So it was customary to pray with arms extended, hands open towards heaven. In fact, the Bible has a lot of different postures to prayer. I'll give you some examples. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse number 22, it says that Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands towards heaven. So here we see uh, prayers sometimes are with uh, standing and outstretched hands. Sometimes the posture is kneeling. Daniel chapter 6, verse number 10 says that Daniel entered his house and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God. 
There's the example of sitting. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse number 18. Then David the king went in and he sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you have brought me this far? There's the posture of bowing the head. Genesis 24, verse number 26. Then the man bowed low, worshiped the Lord. There's the posture of lifting the eyes. John chapter 17, verse number 1. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glory you. So sometimes it's the bowing of the head. Sometimes it's the lifting of the eyes. Sometimes it's the falling down on the ground. Genesis 17, verse number 3 says, Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him. So, may you understand, the important thing is not about the posture of the body. The important thing is the posture of the heart. That's what matters. And in our text, Paul gives us two essential elements that must be, be met for our prayers to be effective. The first one, that is having a right relationship with God. Notice he uses the phrase uh, lifting holy hands. It's not just the raising of any hands. No, it's the raising of holy hands. Psalm chapter 66, verse number 18 says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So if we have unresolved sin in our lives, we cannot expect God to, to answer our prayers. We must come to Him in a right relationship with Him. So we're to have a right relationship with God. And we're also to have a right relationship with others. As He says, lifting holy hands. Then He says, without wrath and dissension. A person who's a troublemaker rather than a peacemaker cannot pray and expect God to answer those prayers. When we have anger in our heart, we'll often have open disagreements with others. And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 14, to do all things without grumbling or disputing. Which means, I'll simplify it, effective praying means that I am in a right relationship with God and a right relationship with with others. Now, just imagine for a moment. Imagine. What if we spent more time preparing our lives to pray? What if we spent more time getting our hearts right before God and others before rushing into prayer with little to no thought or consideration about those things. That we be in a right relationship with God and have right relationships with others. And being in a right relationship with God symbolized by lifting up holy hands. Whether you're lifting up hands or you're on your knees or you're laying down, you're standing, you're sitting, whatever the physical posture, it is a true posture of the heart that makes the difference then we're to pray for the needs the perceived needs the known needs needs of yourself needs of others we're to intercede on behalf of others we're to do all of that willing to spend short times in prayer willing to commit long time in prayer willing to be characterized as being consistent in our prayers. Not just turning to God at every moment when there's a crisis and we want or expect something from Him, but also turning to Him when there's not a crisis, when there are no expectations, to give thanks, praise, honor, and glory because of who He is and what He's doing in and through our lives. May we be a people who pray.
May this be a church that is known for praying. May we love one enough to, to truly intercede and to pray for and with each other. And may we do it consistently for the honor and the glory of God. May every single one of us embrace the privilege of prayer.